Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel, from disastrous expeditions on Everest, to climbing the murder wall, to fixing ropes in K2's bottleneck, or 2022's worst mountaineering tragedy. We cover it all. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. K2 lived up to her reputation in 2023. July 27, 2023 was a roller coaster for the mountaineering community as records were broken and a life was lost. Nothing comes easy on the Savage Mountain, but there is one area on one of the most technical peaks in the world that is utterly terrifying. It has killed climbers for over 50 years, but still leaves everyone impressed and uneasy at the same time when they lay their eyes on it the bottleneck. There are few landmarks that have the same notoriety as the giant Serac on the Savage Mountain, and climbers in 2023 would come to respect and know the dangers the ice holds as history was rewritten. Kristen Harilla and Tenjin Sherpa, better known as Lama, planned to reach the top of K2. They had reached the summit of 13 of the 14 8000ers, and the Savage Mountain was their final obstacle in accomplishing their goal of setting a new true summit world record, reaching the top of all 14 peaks in the shortest amount of time. I cannot understate how difficult this is. Both Kristen and Lama are incredible mountaineers, but while they have the support of so many Sherpas, climbers, and even a camera crew documenting every step, there was a porter who would be on the mountain blazing a trail for everyone to the summit. Muhammad Hassan from Pakistan was helping fix ropes in the death zone on K2. He should have never been there, and just hours later, climbers would be stepping over his body in the bottleneck. This is his story. K2 is one of the most technical and difficult mountains in the world. It is called the Savage Mountain because for every four climbers who reach the summit, one dies. It is a pyramid-shaped peak that is void of any life because of its remote location. The treacherous slopes and extremely difficult topography create deadly avalanches at all points of the year, and its weather well, even the small storms have killed many climbers. But what makes K2 so notorious is the challenges you face above 8,000 meters, where the oxygen is a third of what it is at sea level. After entering the death zone, climbers have to traverse a narrow couloir which is overhung by giant seracs called the bottleneck. It is actually the safest way to reach the summit, yet it is the cause of a significant amount of deaths on the mountain. With the rise in mountaineering since 2021, there are new expedition companies popping up left and right as they collect very expensive fees for the promise that they will give climbers a shot at summiting some of the most dangerous mountains in the world. This is causing a problem. With the rise of inexperienced climbers on the mountains such as K2 and Everest, there is a need for more Sherpas and porters, especially at high altitudes. Enter inexperienced local climbers looking to make a paycheck to support their families. While most of these men are more capable than most of us to climb 8,000 meter peaks, it is still an incredibly dangerous feat, but the reality is that companies need the help. And if there are men willing to climb the mountain to carry supplies and fix ropes, even with little to no experience, well, they will be hired. Muhammad Hassan was a resident of the Shingar district in Pakistan, where he lived with his wife and three kids. He led a healthy lifestyle and by all measures fit the mountaineering build. Some climbers even noted he had a natural ability and showed a great work ethic, but what he lacked was experience. He had only been to K2 base camp before 2023, but never on the mountain. Even with no experience, he was hired by Layla Peak Expedition to be a high altitude porter for the 2023 season. Muhammad would take any job that he could get, and actually would prefer to be on the mountain, as he needed to make money quickly for his mother who had fallen sick and needed treatment. Climbers who worked on the slopes of K2 would earn slightly more than just everyday porters, so for Mohammed, it was a no-brainer. But to fully understand what would happen next on K2, it is important to understand how Sherpas and porters complete their jobs. On the mountain, every expedition is expected to pitch in, especially at high altitudes. This is is important on a peak like K2, as it is one of the most technical climbs on our planet and requires a team of individuals to fix ropes and carry supplies above 8,000 meters so that all other paying climbers have a chance to reach the summit. Muhammad would be assigned to the high altitude group that would be trailblazing 
or creating a path to the summit. This is typically reserved for some of the strongest, experienced, and well-prepared climbers, as even simple tasks such as laying ropes in the death zone can take hours, not to mention doing this in knee-deep snow with avalanches sliding down the slope next to you and a giant serac spanning hundreds of feet over your head, ominously looking down on you. Many of these men do not have a choice, as climbing mountains is the most profitable job they can hold. And yet, as they were setting the trail above 8,000 meters, there was another team on K2 who were there to complete a multi-year project and rewrite history. Kristen and Lama's journey began with the goal to summit the world's most formidable peaks. Each mountain posed unique difficulties, yet their spirit and experience navigated them through every ascent, setting them apart as extraordinary alpinists. Their mission in 2023 would be named She Moves Mountains, and actually started in 2022. Kristen had summited 12 of the 14 8000ers last year, but because she couldn't obtain permits to climb Cho Oyu and Shishka Pengma, she would have to wait until this year. That is why she started with reaching the top of Shiska Pengma in 2023, then summoning Cho Oyu six days later. She would reach the pinnacle of the next mountain, Makalu, ten days later. Then the climbs would start flowing in, with the community tracking her expedition through the internet. Everest would be the fifth mountain she conquered on May 23rd, 26 days into her expedition. Kristen and Lama would summit eight of the nine mountains remaining between May 23rd and July 12th, putting them on track to break the previous record of six months and six days. Kristen and Lama would reach K2 in July of 2023, with the Savage Mountain being the last mountain they needed to conquer to accomplish their multi-year goal. The weather for most of the season was brutal, and the pictures show long lines of climbers fighting up the slopes in poor visibility and heavy snowfall. It was predicted that there would have been only a small window to summit the peak in late July, and this led to many expeditions preparing for a very busy mountain, especially at high altitudes. But July was littered with heavy snowfall, delaying any and all efforts to fix ropes above Camp 3. Weather forecasts had shown the potential window for the first summits to take place on Monday, July 24, but whiteout conditions on the mountain led to no progress being made. The following day, on July 25th, the weather finally started to improve, and climbers at base camp who had been acclimating to the mountain began pushing their way up to higher camps. The new forecast would roll in, and July 27th would be the new summit day. It would be the only day the mountain would allow climbers to reach the top for the season. With this new revelation, hundreds of climbers push for higher altitudes, with over 150 mountaineers planning on making a summit attempt. Obviously, this caused problems. One of the biggest concerns with the heavy snowfall is all the soft powder on the slopes. The rule of thumb is to wait at least 24 to 36 hours to allow new snow to bond the existing snow. Snow. Otherwise, the risk of avalanches greatly increases, but with only one day to feasibly attempt a summit, nobody was going to wait. On July 26 at 6 p.m., the rope-fixing team, including Muhammad, would leave Camp 3 and make their way towards the bottleneck. Camp 4 was essentially non-existent, as the weather had made it too difficult to establish, meaning climbers would have to travel a much greater distance this season to reach the top of the mountain. Sherpas would say that Muhammad did not have the proper clothing or equipment to climb in high altitudes, but he was looking to help support the team. The weather was still brutal, but even with the snowfall and horrible conditions, the climbers would push forward, as they were the only hope that anyone had to reaching the summit. They slowly made their way through the thick snow, passing a desolate Camp 4, pushing towards the giant serac that hanged over their heads. Over 100 climbers would follow the first groups hours later, giving the Sherpas and high-altitude porters time to fix the ropes. By midnight, the route from Camp 3 to the summit was crowded, with lines of climbers making their way to the top. Sylvia Azdriva, a climber from Bulgaria, would describe the conditions. During the summit push, there were five avalanches next to us below the bottleneck. One of them hit some of us on the way up. Luckily, we weren't injured and we managed to dig out of the snow. We debated if we would continue or give up. 
Many expeditions would turn around at this point, with famous mountaineer Garrett Madison stating, With the recent snow on the upper reaches of K2, our team has made the prudent decision to abort their summit push. While many ascending from Camp 3, the team experienced deep snow that accumulated in the days prior and had not fully consolidated. It was clear that the conditions were poor, but Kristen and Lama were nearing the bottleneck in the early hours in the morning. It was at 2.20 a.m. in the middle of the bottleneck when disaster would strike. Muhammad had been exhausted for hours, yet he continued to help, even ignoring the warnings from the Sherpas telling him to turn back. In poor conditions and thick snow, it only takes one wrong step, and that is exactly what would happen. Muhammad would slip. The only thing stopping him from tumbling down the slope was his anchor and the rope connecting around his body, but he would still fall down the traverse. Eventually, his body came to a stop and he was laying face down with a broken oxygen mask crying out. A Sherpa from another team and one of the camera members for Kristen and Lama's climb would help Muhammad back to the traverse, but he was broken. He could no longer move under his own power, so he lay there unable to move as climbers stepped over him on their way to the summit. Muhammad lay in the middle of the traverse, and soon there was a line of climbers below him. One by one, they climbed over Muhammad, who lay there barely breathing, unable to move. The photos of the incident are gut-wrenching, and I have blurred certain areas for privacy, but please be warned, if you Google Muhammad's story, there are plenty of videos and pictures showing mountaineers climbing over his body on their way to the summit. It would later come out that Muhammad would lay on the slope for three hours before he passed away. Three hours of lines of climbers traversing over his body. Three hours of constant avalanches covering him as he lay there. Then the snow being swept off by the boots of other climbers. I cannot imagine a worse way to go. One climber would state, I do not know how there was no attempt to rescue him. Although he was in a very complex place, right on the trail in the middle of the traverse under the Great Serac, people literally had to jump over him on their way to the summit. Another Sherpa on the peak at the time would state, there is no rescue on K2. Hours later at 10.45 a.m., Kristen and Lama would reach the top of K2, completing their expedition and reaching the summit of all 14 8,000 meter peaks in a record time three months in one day. I do want to note that while some climbers argue that summiting the tallest peaks in the world has become easier over the years because of the amount of support and equipment being used, Kristen and Lama's accomplishment is still a monumental endeavor and their success should be celebrated. However you feel about Muhammad's recklessness at the end of the day, he was not prepared for the high altitudes and technicality of climbing K2, yet he felt he had to because that was the only way he could help his sick mother. Two things can be true at once. We should celebrate the accomplishments of Kristen and Lama, but at the same time feel disgrace around how the community literally and figuratively stepped over Muhammad. Sherpas and porters are essentially climbing any high altitude peak, and many of them put their their lives in danger to make it easier for others to climb. Also, they can make a living for their mothers, fathers, wives, and children. But when asked to repeat the favor, nobody came to help. I realize that in high altitudes, everyone knows the risk, but there simply was no effort made here. Two things can be true at once. The 2023 Everest climbing season ended several months ago, yet there are still climbers who are missing on the tallest peak in the world. They are presumed to be dead, yet their bodies have not been found. This caps off the deadliest climbing season in the mountain's history, and even more controversies surround the peak, with little answers or solutions to the problems that climbers will continue to face in 2024 and beyond. But for 17 men and women, their lives are tragically over. This is their story. As 17 lives lost, 2023 has become Everest's deadliest year. While the 2015 earthquake took the lives of 19 to 21 individuals, they were not all on the peak. Thus, 2023 has taken that record. Climbing the tallest mountain in the world is safer than ever. So why are record deaths being recorded after 50 plus years of mountaineering? 
One of the biggest reasons, which I've covered extensively on this channel, is the record number of climbers not only on Everest, but other dangerous peaks such as K2. Nepal continues to issue more and more permits because tourism is the country's greatest revenue source, but the number of climbers is not the only reason we are seeing a rise in tragedies. Lack of regulation on the peak also plays a big part. Over the last several months, more details and accounts of the season are being released to the public. One of the biggest trends we are seeing is the lack of preparation and supplies further up on the mountain. Some chalk this up to inexperienced climbers and expedition teams, but the fact is, with no regulations on the peak, people will continue to do what benefits them, not others or the mountain, including leaving piles of trash scattered throughout the different camps. There were also several reports of a series of thefts at the South Coal, with multiple companies including Adventure Consultants, Arnold Coaster Expedition, Climbing Seven Summits, and Furtenbach Adventures reporting the theft of cooking gear, tents, and oxygen bottles. This is obviously concerning on many levels. But change will not happen quickly. Famous mountaineer and blogger Alan Arnett would state, without an apparent reason for the record deaths, changes will not come quickly if at all. Historically, changes that could reduce tourism revenue for the Nepal government or operators have been rejected. While there are many concerns and negatives stemming from the 2023 season, I do want to point out that growth is not necessarily a bad thing. It must be regulated and controlled to prevent accidents, but innovation is part of what makes us all human. The positives of advanced technology and communication would let Malaysian mountaineer Muhammad Hawari bin Hashim, a deaf mute climber, take on Everest. We have covered a few stories regarding climbers with disabilities, and let me say from our experience Experience that many struggle to accomplish their goal, but it's not impossible. Hawari is from a city in Malaysia called Kapala Batas Penang. There he would hone his climbing skills, living a very active lifestyle from a young age, dreaming about climbing Mount Everest from as early as primary school. His mother would state he is actually someone who is always enthusiastic, confident, and active. He used to participate in all the sports and competitions at school. It is very obvious that while Hawari's disability was a part of who he was, he would not let it define him. In his young adult life, Hawari would begin to channel his love for outdoors and climbing into mountaineering. As he would summit mountains such as Mount Ranjani and Mount Tabing Karaton in Indonesia, he would also make the hike to Annapurna Base Camp in Nepal. Hawari would meet the love of his life, who was also hearing impaired in his home country, then becoming a father of two while working at the Penang Museum. What makes Hawari's story unique is the amount of support that he received from his country he would be joining Pioneer Adventure and those from home would nickname his expedition ME2023 or Malaysia Everest 2023. In 2022, in preparation for his climb, there would be a ceremony where the chief minister would hand over the state flag to Hawaii for motivation and a show of support. He would then state, this is a huge challenge and it is hoped the Malaysian team will make our country proud. However, it is important to stay safe and abide by the safety protocols throughout the journey. The chief minister would also make Hawari promise that after he returned, he would donate his climbing gear to the same museum he worked at to inspire individuals who suffered from disabilities and show that anything was possible. Along with a professional guide who understood sign language and could translate for Hawari, the 33-year-old would also be accompanied by 56 six-year-old Awang Askenbar and Poon Yakub. I've covered Yakub's story in another video, so be sure to check that out. The Malaysian team would begin their journey on April 1st, traveling to Nepal and eventually making their way to Everest's base camp. The entire expedition was expected to span just over two months, with the completion target date being June 11th, right before the summer temperatures hit the mountain, creating unsafe conditions. The South Call route on the mountain was crowded, but the conditions were cooperative with climbers, and Hawari was able to begin acclimatization trips shortly after they arrived at base camp. In fact, things were going very well. All expeditions were ahead of schedule, and with the news of a clear weather window in mid-May, well, it was looking like Hawari would get his chance to reach the summit. The South Call route was the only way up the mountain in 2023. 
Well, I shouldn't say only way, but the most reasonable way to the top. The other popular route up the northeast side of the mountain through Tibet has been closed since 2020, as China still has fears of many foreigners bringing COVID to their country. Some experts say this plays a part in the overcrowding on the South Call route, but with the northeast ridge being the more difficult climb, most inexperienced climbers would still try to climb the easier south side, and there is no expectation that this will change. Wari would begin his final climb on May 15th. As part of a four-man team, he would make his way through the Kumbu Ice Fall in the early hours of the morning, then proceed to climb up the South Col. The entire team of four climbers would reach the trash-ridden Camp 4, just under 8,000 meters. Camp 4 lies on the windswept saddle between Everest and Lhotse, and this is where Jakob's journey would end, as Wari would continue the climb towards the famous Hillary Steps with his guide and translator, Shatar Man Rai. On May 18th at approximately 3.30 p.m., Wari would stand on top of the world, with the Penang flag held to the sky between his arms. He would set a new record being the first Malaysian deaf mute mountaineer to summit the peak. News would spread quickly as the message they had made it to the summit would be transmitted over a walkie-talkie and then on to Wari's family. His mother and wife would state that at the time, the news he had reached the top made them all very happy, although one of the biggest concerns was the time of day. For those familiar with Everest's summit, there is something called the 2 o'clock rule. This means that if a climber cannot reach the summit before 2 p.m., then they must turn around, as summiting later in the afternoon means you will have to descend the peak in the dark further increasing the risk. Because of this rule, Wari would take his picture, plant the flag of his home, and begin the descent down the peak. Thankfully, he would reach Camp 4 safely, and there he would rest before continuing his climb off the mountain. While Wari was resting, one of his expedition members, Jakob, who had stayed behind while Wari made a trip to the summit, began to fall ill, causing all the Sherpas and guides to begin an emergency descent. This essentially left Wari and all the other climbers in Camp 4 alone. So when Wari began his climb a few hours later, he would start the descent by himself, and this would be the last time anyone saw the Malaysian climber. That same day, May 19th, Wari would be reported missing. This wasn't an uncommon occurrence in 2023, as rescue helicopters had practically been on Everest almost every day of the climbing season. Rescue efforts would begin by checking every tent at all the camps, but after Pioneer Adventure saw no sign of the young climber, reality began to set in. What made rescue efforts worse is there was an entire mountain to search, as Wari had disappeared somewhere between Camp 4 and Base Camp. Wari's mother, Chaitanya, Tom and his wife were shocked to hear the news that their son and husband was missing, but they remained hopeful that he would return home, as there was an entire country praying for his safety and well-being. The stories of how the Penang community and political figures came together around the news that Hawari was missing are truly touching, and a great representation of how we can all come together in tough times. A communal gathering for prayers would take place as everyone remained hopeful. There would be little information or news that would make its way to Wari's family, as there really was nothing to report. Rescuers would search crevasses, common fall zones, and every inch of all the camps. But soon days would go by, then weeks, and now months, with no sign of the young climber. While Wari would not be officially confirmed to cease because there was no sign of his body, there is realistically no way for him to survive on the peak. Wari would be marked as the 17th death of the climbing season, marking it the deadliest in the mountain's history. The amount of tragedy in 2023 is overwhelming, but with little to no change expected from the Nepali government, it is hard to believe that this trend will not continue in years to come. We can only pray for climbers already preparing for the 2024 season. The Eiger Generations of alpine climbers consider the menacing north face to be the ultimate challenge. The towering rock soars a mile above the peaceful meadows at its foot, a vertical expanse of crumbling rock, vast ice fields, and a monumental buttress scoured by storms, avalanches, and stonefall. With the popular resort Kleine Scheidig resting at its base, bystanders watch from below through a telescope, creating a truly unique experience, commonly referred to as the most dangerous climb in the Alps, the North Face, or otherwise known as the Murder Wall, has captivated humans throughout our history. 
and none more so than American John Harlan. On March 22, 1966, in the dead of winter, John would be a part of a dramatic race between two teams to climb the wall under a new, more direct route to the summit. This is his story. Bursting with strength and energy, dream and desire, John deliberately strove to expand his life to its furthest possible boundaries. Born on June 30th, 1935, in Kansas City, Missouri, he would fall in love with an active lifestyle. Most notably, John fell in love with climbing and it would be in his sophomore year of college when he first laid eyes on the Iger. Graduating from Stanford, where he was a football player and fine arts major, he seriously considered a career as a dress designer, but instead veered in a totally different direction and joined the United States Air Force. For five years, he served as a jet fighter pilot, first in the United States, then in Germany. During these days, he climbed whenever and wherever he could, until leaving active service in 1963. John and his wife would settle in the town of Laysen in French Switzerland, right in the very heart of his beloved Alps. With it being the 1960s, alpine climbing was the more well-known and adopted style. It's a type of mountaineering that involves small, unsupported teams tackling large, multi-pitch routes that can involve various combinations of rock climbing, ice climbing, and mix climbing. They only bring gear that can be carried and move as quickly as possible. Due to the isolation of alpine climbing, there is no rescue if an issue occurs. John would naturally utilize this style and go on to achieve some notable climbs. Every summer and winter from 1960 to 1966 was spent climbing the Alps, scaling various peaks with increasing difficulties. Most notably, in 1963, he scaled the south face of Aguille de Fou, and in 1965, the west face of Dru, both climbs being registered as the first ascent. Leading up to 1966, John's skills were being recognized by the the top inner circles of Europe's elite mountaineering community. Coming into 1965, John only had eyes for one peak, well I should really say, a wall, the north face of the Eiger. He became obsessed, studying the rock, wanting to find a new way to the top. It was during this period that John noticed a more direct route to the summit was possible, and this would fuel his desire to climb. John would attend the Trento Festival in Italy during autumn, where he met Peter Hogg, a German climber with the same idea as him, and already had a team of eight individuals preparing for the murder wall. Harlan would decline to join forces, as he thought eight people was too much, and with the Second World War finishing within the last 20 years, joining forces with Germans was out of the question. Instead, John would go on to convince famous American rock climber Leighton Core, a Scottish Sherpa, Dougal Hassan, and Chris Bonington, a photographer, to act as a reserve in case he was needed. It would take many months to prepare accordingly, but by February of 1966, the men were in Switzerland, ready for their climb. They would start on February 20th with the idea of making many ascents and descents, carrying gear and fixing lines along the way. Not all the men would be on the face at the same time, as there would be leading climbers and others gathering supplies. The Germans had started just two days earlier and wanted to send the face in one go, but quickly realize this would be very challenging. The North Face does not offer much protection against the conditions. Strong winds attempt to rip your hands off the rock. Ice falls in the path of the climb. Natural protection is extremely limited, and there are only a few locations on the entire face that climbers can camp at. With it being in the middle of winter, the weather was unimaginably brutal. The men would have competent weather models to at least give them an idea of what to expect, but even that would be a struggle. They would patiently wait for a storm to subside before jumping on the wall, setting up lines for two days, and returning to Kleine Scheidegg before the next storm. The process was long and slow, but both teams had to respect Mother Nature. The Germans would be more stubborn than the Anglo-American team, not wanting to get off the mountain for bad weather. So they set up a camp about one third of the way up, nicknamed the Ice Palace. This allowed them to take fewer trips back to the resort and thus can make quicker progress. Word began to spread about the race to climb a new route up the Eiger, and reporters began flocking to the resort, either to watch or interview climbers. Each time the men returned, they looked more and more tired, ice clinging to their beards, and the bottom half of their clothes were completely covered in snow, the cold seeping so deep they could feel it in their bones. 
This hell went on for two weeks, but their efforts would be rewarded in early May as John and team reached the Flatiron. The Germans were a day ahead of them, but the men desperately wanted to catch up. The weather almost seemed too good to be true and they would take advantage. Leighton assisted from below as John and Haston moved quickly, actually overtaking the slower German team after some time by traversing a section of the compacted, refrozen hard snow. It had been a few days since either team had seen each other, so they shared greetings and pleasantries. Hag, the leader of the Germans, reported that himself and one of his companions spent the last two nights without a sleeping bag. However, on March 10th, before either team could continue much further, there were reports of a bad storm coming into the Bernice Alps, and they had to find shelter fast. The Germans made their way to their ice palace while John and Haston found shelter at the bivouac of the Flatiron. The storm was a nightmare. High speed winds, constant blizzard conditions, and several avalanches barely missed them. Both teams endured six days of unimaginable conditions. By the time the storm broke, John was exhausted and desperately wanted off the mountain to rest. The pair, as well as some of the German climbers, would return back to Kleine Scheidig that night where a horde of reporters welcomed them with giant smiles. The Germans did want to reach the summit in one go, so two of the men refused to leave the peak. In order to accommodate his comrades, Hag and the team would start their climb on the very next day. March 17th. John delayed returning to the wall as he had developed bronchitis and instead got a few more days of rest. The American Leighton Corps, who had not been on the face at the time of the storm, would set out behind the Germans, even offering advice with their fixed ropes. John and Hag were both strongly against teaming up, but after spending multiple weeks with no success, the leader of the German team grew more and more open to the idea, although the initiative to merge would not come from him but instead his co-leader, and on the 20th of March, Leighton would officially partner with Carl Golikow, ending the competition between the two teams. By March 21st, Leighton and the Germans had reached the Spider, a dangerous ice wall near the summit, only one major obstacle standing between them and history. To celebrate their success, the men shared a meal together on the mountain, further solidifying the merger between teams. John would learn of Leighton's location through a telescope and was furious to find out he was working with the Germans. A known storm was predicted to hit the mountain on March 24th, and this caused John to hesitate on a summit push, as they really only had three days to make their climb. However, after learning the Germans would not be stopping, John made up his mind and set out on the face. On March 22nd, John and Haston would climb fast, using the already established fixed lines and making great progress. Leighton and the Germans did not actually continue their climb, but instead patiently waited for John to join them. They felt nervous, particularly Hag, as he was unsure how John would react to the merge. Their expectation was that he would have to accept it, but the leader of the Americans has spent over three years developing the route, gathering funding and building his team so it was complicated. John and Haston spent most of the day climbing through technical challenges, traversing rock, and dodging falling ice. By 3 p.m., the pair were finally nearing the spider, the location of the other climbers. They were only about two rope lengths away, but still not in view of each other. Being nearly vertical, John attached himself to a fixed blue rope that Leighton had secured the day before. He put his weight on the rope, positioned his feet against the rock for leverage, and using the proper tool, began pulling himself up inch by inch. Haston watched patiently as John continued to work, his heavy breathing drowning out all the other sounds. For only a moment, time stood still, then a snapping sound, and the falling of a large object. Onlookers from below turned away in horror as they saw a man with a red jacket falling for what seemed like minutes. Pieces of equipment were left scattered in the snow and were visible for all to see. Haston couldn't believe his eyes and took a minute to gather himself. He could not process what he just witnessed and rightfully shaken up, but the others were waiting and so he knew he needed to continue. Hag and Leighton sat there in silence when static broke the air and a radio call repeated the phrase, someone had fallen. A few minutes later, Haston would reach their location and inform them of what happened, confirming the news. The excitement that was felt before was entirely gone, as dread filled its place. The men needed to make a decision quickly on whether to continue or to descend. There were mixed opinions, with Leighton strongly refusing to climb, but Haston's arguing that they needed to summit in order to honor John. After debating for a while, a decision was made. 
Haston, along with Hag and three other Germans, would continue. If they were successful, the route would be named after John. The next day, supplies had to be brought up to the men, so they delayed their climb until the afternoon. They would reach the start of the summit ice field, but that night, a storm with winds, speeds of 100 kilometers per hour, or 62 miles per hour, would settle on the mountain, creating whiteout conditions. The men below had already descended, actually removing the fixed lines, meaning Haston and the four Germans had to reach the summit and walk down the west flank if they were to return. There was no other option. March 24th brought more bad weather, but the men persevered through the harsh conditions, not letting it deter them, and on March 25th, they managed to reach the summit. The American photographer, Chris Bonington, climbed the easier west face at the same time the Germans climbed the north face, and took their picture, marking this historic moment. I want to note that two of the Germans never left the peak, and during 22 consecutive days of hellish ice and shadow, the murder wall remains a monument for the Alps, beckoning all those brave enough to face it. Although John would ultimately lose his life, the route would be named in his honor. He would be surpassed by John Harlan III, who would also fall in love with climbing, but made the intention of staying away from dangerous peaks. However, in 2005, to honor his father's legacy, he would go on and summit the same peak that ultimately took him. Hag would go on to later state, five men climbed the same rope, Four times the rope held. On the fifth time, it broke. Why did it break? Fate. At 1 a.m. on October 4, 2022, Ankush Sharma's eyes shot open excitedly. He was high on India's Draupadi Kaidanda 2, a 5,670 meter or 18,600 feet peak in the Gangotri range of the Garval Himalaya near the Chinese border. The mountain, often called DKD2, is surrounded by intimidating 6,000 meter giants like Talay Sagar, Shivling, and Maru. Considered a safe zone and avalanche free area, it is the training spot of India's Nehru Institute of Mountaineering, or NIM for short, one of the country's top climbing schools. Sharma, 23 at the time, began preparing himself some tea as other students around him began waking up. He had joined a 28-day advanced mountaineering course, and it had all led to this moment. It was summit day. This is their story. After Tenzing and Hillary completed the first ascent of Everest in 1953, the sport saw a major boom in popularity. India, particularly, gained a national interest because Tenzing resided in the country. This increase in demand saw the birth of certain organizations, like NIM, which was formed in 1965. However, India had another reason to partake in mountaineering as well. Since 1947, there have been border disputes with Pakistan. The terrain in the contest is littered with mountain passes and valleys, causing varying elevation levels. The sport is so important to the government that mountaineering and high-altitude warfare are deemed essential skills for India's armed forces. To encourage participation, the Ministry of Defense has created and backed institutes like NIM, subsidizing all for training. NIM is located in Uttarkashi, an adventure town on the banks of the Bhagirathi River, where students learn the basics of rock and ice climbing, navigation, and other survival skills. If they do well, they have the option to participate in future expeditions. In India, you must pass this course if you want to be involved with mountaineering. There is no other way. The demand for one of these spots has gotten so high, the wait is more than two and a half years. On October 4th, NIM's expedition of DKD2 would be well underway with 46 participants. Seven instructors led 34 students, three porters, and one nursing assistant. They would also be a solo climber unaffiliated with the group that set out after them and planned to ski down the summit. Sunil Lawani, a 28-year-old Mumbai native with short dark hair, did not wake up at 1 a.m. for tea, but instead slept an additional hour. Lawani formerly worked in marketing, where he had limited free time 
but he quit after learning about hiking in 2015. The outdoors altered his life. Another 28-year-old, Deep Tucker, a part-time fund manager with a closed crop beard and glasses, traveled from Gujarat, a coastal city in India, to the highlands in the state of Humachal Pradesh to prepare for legendary mountains like Nepal's Amadablam. His first 5,000-meter summit would be DKD2. Outside, there was a slight cold breeze as tiny snowflakes began pelting the students. By 3.30 a.m., the sky was clear and the group was ready to move. They set out from Camp 1 at 4,815 meters or 15,800 feet. The leaders of the pack plowed through shin-deep snow, leaving a clear trail to follow. When the group arrived at Rambo Rock, their first landmark, at a height of roughly 16,800 feet, they clipped into a fixed line the first of several that day, and traversed the brief rocky stretch using ice axes and crampons. Tucker was near the back of the group and watched as each headlamp in front of him bounced up and down off the snow. They moved to the right before climbing upwards, carefully avoiding small cracks in the glacier. Despite being a rather large team, they made good progress. Before long, the sky was a shade brighter and the sun could be seen on the horizon. As they climbed, Lawani, positioned in the middle of the group, saw a small amount of snow slide down from above. It was not enough to knock anyone over or deter them, but it certainly alarmed the young climber. Although, the students would take comfort in knowing that NIM picked DKD2 for a reason. It was a very safe peak with no reported accidents since 1981. Sharma, one of the most enthusiastic students in the group, was at the front with the leaders. His eyes grew big when the summit came into view. They only had about 150 meters or 500 feet left to go, but needed to wait for additional fixed lines to be set up by the instructors. Nearly all of the 46 climbers were gathered together on the slope and ready to ascend while fastened to the fixed line with a carabiner. They were outfitted in the traditional orange helmets and red and blue jackets with NIM patches on the chest. Right around 8.30 a.m., Sharma took a step and unclipped himself from the end of the fixed line. He had reached the summit snowfield. He walked towards an instructor who was already at the top. It was completely silent. Then a crack formed. A big slab avalanche was released behind him. The slope shattered into ice and snow chunks that flowed like water. Everything below the fracture line started to move. Tucker viewed in horror from a few hundred feet below. There was no time for a response. As it turned downhill to slide over turned climbers and gain speed, a man tripped over Lawani and fell upward. Lawani tried to stop them from moving by slamming his ice axe into the snow, but they were carried down the mountain. He attempted to keep his head above the pile of snow as they slid, but he felt like he was drowning. Sharma, almost on the summit at this point, glanced back and his heart immediately dropped. He initially couldn't believe his eyes. The fixed rope was gone and all of his friends had vanished, yet he had heard nothing. The survivors estimated that they were dragged by the avalanche for 15 to 30 seconds. 34 climbers were forced over the lip of a deep, narrow crevasse at a height of almost 18,000 feet and thrown into a free fall, while some came to a stop on the hill. The snow that accumulated around them packed itself in a hard layer once they reached the bottom, almost 50 feet below, encasing them alive. Tucker was among those who fell into the crevasse and prayed as he was swept off his feet. Luckily, he landed on his stomach with his mouth and nose not buried, so he was able to breathe. Snow kept falling on him and then another climber fell on top of him. A pair of steel crampons nicked Tucker's lip, drawing blood. The boot was still twitching for a few minutes and the person stopped moving entirely. Tucker realized whoever it was next to him had just suffocated. The chances of surviving an avalanche burial dropped dramatically after 15 minutes, and even under ideal conditions, it might be challenging to rescue just one person in that time. He began screaming as loud as he could for help. Lawani, who was also in the crevasse, turned his head to create an air pocket. He was completely buried, yet his face was just slightly covered in snow, not restricting his airflow. Suraj Singh Ghassan, a 26-year-old trainee, fell as well and lost consciousness but would shortly regain it. He opened his eyes and saw light, which terrified and confused him. His body was covered in the snow, but his head was visible. His mind drifted to what mattered most, his daughter. News spread quickly on the mountain and those below in a position to help quickly became organized. The radio chatter was incoherent as many people were shouting for answers. A porter carrying a stretcher was seen bolting across base camp, running to DKD2. 
very quickly a large-scale rescue effort was underway. Those that did not get swept into the crevasse rushed to its edge. A man was seen crying as an instructor peered into the hole and saw a few heads protruding from the snow. A student could be heard yelling, Don't worry, we are coming to save you. Sharma would assist from above, helping set up a pulley system to raise any victims. The solo skier, not a part of NIM, was the first to be rescued. They did not have shovels, so the rescuers were on their hands and knees using helmets and a pair of skis to dig. Luani remained trapped for over an hour, until he was finally reached. One of the instructors cleared the snow from his face and told him, You are alive, you will make it out. Tucker was also confirmed to be alive, and they began digging around his body as well. Savita Kanswal, an instructor, was discovered with her hands cupped around her mouth to create an air pocket. Savita had just broken a national record by climbing Everest and Makalu in 16 days. She didn't survive the avalanche. Tucker would be removed after three hours and shouted, I don't have my leg, I can't stand. An instructor lent him his jacket as they placed three more climbers next to Tucker. All three were dead. Some of the men back at base camp tried to help as much as possible. A team was quickly organized as they would set out on foot to the avalanche location. But the weather began to worsen and by 1.30 p.m. a storm had settled on the mountain causing a whiteout. It was not long before they heard the first confirmed death over the radio, followed by another and another. Those that did survive were brought up from the crevasse and quickly assessed. Once they were settled, men would be assigned to carry them down straight to base camp. The biggest concern for those climbers who were trapped within the snow was hypothermia, so the instructors and men at base camp began preparing hot food and fresh clothes. By 4 p.m., the sky was clear, and the sound of whirling air coming from a helicopter's blade was a relief to everyone still on the mountain. News of the avalanche spread like wildfire in the media. The sat phones at base camp would not stop ringing as it was pure chaos. Many parents waited with bated breath to hear about their children. However, there would be no clear information to provide until well into that night. Of the 34 people who fell into the crevasse, only five survived. Deep Tucker, Suna Lawani, Suraj Singh Gusan, and Kit Kandial and Jerry, the solo skier, 29 climbers perished in the DKD2 avalanche, marking it as one of the deadliest mountaineering disasters in history. Their ages range from 18 to 47. The victims came from all walks of life. Many were fathers, solo breadwinners, promising young mountaineers, military personnel, a yoga instructor, a boxing aficionado, and others. A circumstance where there are 29 entire burials deep inside a chasm makes rescue difficult. On that day, only those who landed with their heads above the rubble avoided being washed into the chasm. The local media almost immediately began asking why this occurred on such an infamously safe peak. There was an investigation, and there are some theories, but honestly, the actual reason will never be known for certain. A NIM spokesman did come forward after the incident and cited the organization's long-standing relationship with the mountain and their excellent safety track record. The reality is that sometimes in the mountains, you can do everything right and still end up in trouble. It is no one's fault. It is simply a part of the sport. The student and Kush Sharma would make it back to base camp by 9 p.m. that night, exhausted and barely able to move. His friends were crying around him as they hugged each other for comfort. We could not save them. They all died in front of us. They were young kids, one of the instructors, Khan said. No one could remember experiencing a night that dark on DKD2 before. Nils Antinzana opened his eyes on May 18, 2004, in his small tent at 8,000 meters on Mount Everest's Camp 4. His breathing was labored, as he had been sleeping for the last few hours in the death zone, one of the few places on our planet that is void of any life, and is literally killing the cells in your body the second you decide to climb this high. Nils did not know that this would be his final time ever waking from his sleep. He was 69 years old and attempting to become the oldest climber to ever reach the roof of the world. His guide, Lisi Gustavo, was waking up beside him. Together, the pair had been preparing for this day for months, but for Nils, it had been an entire lifetime. It was summit day. This 
is their story. Gladys Antenzana had just woken in her Baltimore hospital bed, resting after a minor surgery. She was waiting for a phone call from her husband Nils, who had always called her after reaching the summit of countless mountains across the world. But this peak was different. Nils was climbing the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. For more than two decades, Nils Antenzana had been the chief of pathology at Jefferson Memorial Hospital in Alexandria. He was an immigrant who received his medical training in Bolivia before passing the U.S. exam with the ability to speak little English. In 1994, after the hospital closed, he worked as a freelancer with several different medical offices and hospitals providing consultations. This gave him a lot more free time. At first, he filled it with charity work, but even his wife recalled a moment where Nils would say, Say, with you, I am very happy, but I seem to be missing something. Nils would begin exploring other hobbies, such as scuba diving, hand gliding, skydiving, and eventually mountaineering. While he enjoyed having an active lifestyle, there was just something about the mountains that attracted him. Nils would dive into this passion, but almost nobody knew of his secret hobby. His wife noticed one day her husband was missing and would start asking around where he was. She eventually heard it from a family friend that he was climbing a peak in Bolivia and would be gone for four days. She would state, I don't know why he didn't want me and others to know, but sometimes he was just that way. One morning after taking a shower, Nils would look at his wife and say, Gladys, I want to go to Everest. She had heard of his dream for years and knew that she could not stop him. The truth was the mountain scared her, but she couldn't say no. Instead, she said, God bless you. Nils would begin preparing for the expedition almost right away. He went off to South America to dive into climbing. He began reading articles and journals around oxygen famished high altitudes. He read Everest books over and over, analyzing important areas, and even looked into medications that might ward off high altitude sickness. On one of Nils' trips to South America, he would meet Gustavo Lisi, and within weeks, Lisi became Nils' climbing partner. Gustavo was much younger than Nils, but they developed a bond on the mountain and just a month later, Nils would ask Gustavo to accompany him to Everest, as he felt better with a native Spanish speaker by his side. Nils agreed to pay all of Gustavo's expenses, with a bonus of 10,000 US dollars, for successfully bringing him to the summit of Everest and back. Gustavo agreed, and the men began putting their plan into motion. The pair would fly to Rome in early April, where they would meet an Italian man named Manuel Logli, the head of an expedition company called the Infinite Knot. Manuel would secure permits for the duo, along with providing everything they would need to summit Everest, such as food, drinks, oxygen, and of course, tents. Manuel would hire two experienced Sherpas to guide and provide assistance where needed. Nils and Gustavo would technically be a part of a nine-man expedition, but really, they only joined the group to pay a cheaper permit fee. Nils paid 20 20,000 US dollars for both of them to obtain access to the mountain and they made it clear to the expedition that once they reached Everest, they would use the supplies they paid for, but they would be climbing alone. Manuel would state in an email to the Washington Post that the pair made Gustavo's role very clear. He would be Nil's guide. There was no rules or regulations from the Nepali government that says climbers must remain part of the expeditions they obtain their permits through, so nobody batted an eye that the duo wanted to climb alone. In fact, it was pretty normal for small groups to band together on paper for cheaper rates. Manuel would keep an eye on Nils through their trek to base camp, as he wanted to see how strong the elderly climber was, but he soon realized it was not Nils he needed to worry about. According to Manuel, Nils told him that midway through the first week, while ascending toward a small village at an altitude of 14,500 feet, Gustavo trekked so far ahead of him that Nils lost sight of his guide and got confused when he arrived at a fork in the path. Nils eventually chose the wrong direction and walked for over an hour before he realized his mistake and had to double back. Nils would have to receive treatment the following day for a sore throat and would describe his climbing partner as rude and disrespectful. Gustavo had called Nils stupid for getting lost, yelling at him, and Nils had even threatened to fire him, but the duo would continue working together. After reaching Everest's base camp, the problems would continue for Nils. He would develop an upper respiratory tract infection, making it difficult to breathe, along with dehydration and general weakness. He would lose 16 pounds before he even began to climb the mountain and had serious thoughts about returning home. But Nils had been preparing his entire life for this climb, and after resting for four days, he would start his 
acclimatization trips. There are four camps above base camp, and the acclimatization tracks are limited to the first three, with expeditions trekking up and down the mountain over frozen, dangerously unstable ice falls as tall as skyscrapers, and along steep faces where climbers latch themselves on fixed ropes nailed into the mountain, where one mistake can mean a fatal fall. Gustavo would continue to leave Nils during their climbs, and Nils would state in his journal, I almost fired him. He does not have a good sense of responsibility, and confuses it with servitude. On Friday, May 7th, an accomplished Mexican climber named Hector Ponce de Leon says he saw Nils' party descending from the 24,000 foot Camp 3 toward Camp 2, a journey that eventually took the climbers onto a glacier pitted in places by crevasses undetectable beneath the snow. Hector glanced at Nils and worried. He looked for Gustavo, who was about 220 yards ahead of him, a speck in the distance. I thought to myself, Gustavo left him. Unbelievable. Nils appeared unstable, unable to walk a straight line. He was wasted, and they were only in the climatization climbs. He was so wasted he couldn't even see the right way to the camp. Several climbers and Sherpas had concerns about Gustavo, which only magnified when they learned that there was actually no record of him reaching Everest's summit in 2000, which he claimed was the case to anyone who would listen. After being confronted, he would adamantly deny that he ever made such claims. 30 days into their expedition, the duo would begin to prepare for their final push for the summit. The pair would set out on the Kumbu Icefall early in the morning, along with many other climbers, kicking off their final trip up the mountain. Their expedition went well until they reached Camp 3. Nils would climb from Camp 3 to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet without bottled oxygen. To put this into perspective, even some of the most experienced guides in the world use bottled oxygen past Camp 3, unless they are attempting a summit without it. This is because Camp 4 lies in the death zone, an area where the oxygen is a third of what it is at sea level. Worse, any oxygen famished body will be that much more susceptible in the death zone to conditions such as hypothermia and cerebral edema, the latter condition being where fluids leak from blood vessels and swell the brain, bringing a coma and swift death if untreated. Gustavo would later state that Nils had insisted on climbing without bottled oxygen between Camp 3 and 4, claiming that he wanted nothing the others in the party wouldn't be using. Two Sherpas would claim that Nils would be forced to use oxygen during the final hour and a half of the climb, as he was tiring and slowing down, barely able to take steps up the slope. To combat this, Gustavo would claim they needed to rest a day in the death zone. A Sherpa on the mountain at the time would state, A terrible decision. The air has so little oxygen up there that every moment you spend there takes something more out of you. It is not a place to rest long. Everyone knows that. On May 17th, Nils would call his wife from Camp 4 and let her know that they were preparing to make the final summit push and they would be leaving that night in the dark. And that's exactly what they did. The temperature was estimated to be minus 7 degrees. Another group that passed Nils on the way to the summit would notice how much he struggled. He relied on the support of his ice axe to stand and they thought that he would be turning around as there was no way he could reach the summit. The two Sherpas that were hired to provide assistance to Nils and Gustavo would tell them to turn around, but they would both claim they did not quit and would not leave the peak. After 14 hours of climbing, Nils would cross the final ridge at approximately 10 a.m. He would stand on top of the world, accomplishing his dream. He was the oldest American and second oldest climber to ever reach the summit. They would spend 40 minutes at the top, exhausted and admiring the views above the clouds. Most climbers spend minutes on the slope, but Nils was simply too tired to begin his descent. Almost immediately after starting their climb down, Nils would have issues. The adrenaline was gone and his body was beginning to fail. It took an hour before he collapsed for the first time. Those around the pair would state that he was showing classic signs of cerebral edema. He was disoriented, unstable, his sight impaired, and his movements reduced to stumbles. It would take three hours for them to descend 300 feet. The sun began to go down and the realization of the predicament began to set in. While there were many mistakes made on this climb, what would happen next would be the most egregious of them all. 
Gustavo would begin descending the mountain at a faster pace, leaving Nils with two Sherpas who were practically carrying him down the mountain. For the next several hours, the two Sherpas would continue to support Nils, but he would soon begin to slip in and out of consciousness. About 100 feet ahead of them, Gustavo would dig a bivouac in the snow, climb into his sleeping bag, and begin to nap. By later afternoon, the Sherpas were spent. They began to think that they themselves would be in trouble. As they propped Nils against a block of ice and snow to rest at the balcony, an area about 1,600 feet above Camp 4. The two Sherpas would remove their coat and place it on Nils along with removing their extra bottles of oxygen, placing them within reach against the doctor's side. They had done everything they could, but Nils needed more help than they could provide. Hours later, they would come across Gustavo and shake him awake as he was at risk of developing hypothermia if he continued to sleep. Gustavo would pack up his supplies and continue down the mountain with the Sherpas. When they came across another group ascending the mountain, they would inform them that there was a climber at the balcony, but there was some miscommunication as there seemed to be no urgency or need for a rescue. The climbers attempting their own summit would note that all three men were exhausted and it looked like they had a rough climb. The two Sherpas would eventually leave Gustavo as he was moving too slow and they needed to get down the mountain quickly since they had given up their jackets. But eventually, all three men made it back to Camp 4. And they would fail to inform anyone that Nils was still further up on the mountain in dire need of a rescue. The following day, a storm would begin to cloud the peak. And after climbers realized there was a man stranded at the balcony, well, it was too late. There may have been a chance the night before to save Nils, but there was no chance now. Gustavo would call Nils' wife the following morning and describe that there was a terrible accident. But as details began to release, Gladys became furious that more efforts were not made to save her husband or even stop him from summiting. But Gustavo would state that Nils had told him, I want to stay here. The mountain is my home. Controversy would follow the expedition. Many didn't believe Gustavo was telling the full story or had even lied about some details, but to this day it serves as one of the prime examples of what not to do on a mountain like Everest.